Hi, so this is a recording of my SCA 2024 presentation on a multi-layer solver for XPBD by myself and my thesis supervisor, Paul Cry. Elastic simulations are typically slow as you need to compute the deformation of all the volumetric elements. But let's note that not everything is going to deform at the same rate during your simulations. Moreover, some parts likely move in similar directions, like each independent tentacle in this scene. A popular method for real-time applications is XPBD. Basically, each elastic element is represented by a constraint, and the constraints are solved somewhat sequentially in a Gauss-Seidel-like way. It's popular because of how easy it is to parallelize. Using pre-computed graphical learning, independent constraints can be solved in parallel. It's also easy to add new constraints like pin vertices, joints, distance constraints, and more. However, because each iteration only propagates the information locally, the convergence of XPBD is slow. There are opportunities to cheaply improve the propagation. And that is what long-range constraints and long-range attachments do. So there are constraints that attach springs to distant elements to help the propagation of information. Such constraints change the formulation of the problem, needing to eventually be dropped for ground truth simulations. Our solver will be greatly inspired by these concepts. To our knowledge, there's no strain rate based multi layer solver currently available, but there's been some work on hierarchical multi grid like solvers in XPBD. For instance, Miller made a multi layer solver where the layers would be different geometries of the same model. Their solver goes from a coarse approximation of their continuous model and refines the constraints until they reach a desirable resolution. For our solver, we'll need rigid bodies and rigid elastic coupling, much like what is described in the rigid body XPBD paper. We also focused on reducing the cost of non-deformation and our own work on adaptive rigidification. We want to monitor strain rates to identify parts that move rigidly and then approximate the regions as rigid bodies. This led to significant speed-ups in computation times, with simulation often orders of magnitude faster than the elastic simulations. So this was implemented in a Newton solve and only approximated the simulations. Perhaps it would make sense to instead use the strengths of XPBD for efficient simulations. We use some ideas from our own work on adaptive rigidification methods as the inspiration for our choice of reduction model per layer. While adaptive rigidification aimed at providing fast and approximate solutions, we now want to speed up the convergence towards the ground truth. So while there are going to be similarities, this is completely different. So let me get rid of my own work for now. The overarching idea of this project is that we can let the simulation choose the different resolutions that our multi-layer solver will use. Obviously, there exist techniques like remeshing that allow adaptive refinement, but they often lead to nightmarish discretizations and potentially unstable simulations. We won't suffer from that. We only need a single well-conditioned model. Because we are using rigidification layers, we don't need to remesh or store different resolutions of the same model. Our multi-layer solver automatically generates the different resolutions as rigidification patterns. Because the finest resolution is meant to be elastic, we obtain accurate solutions. This means that we have a fully-fledged iterative solver instead of the approximations featured in the original adaptive rigidification. Similarly to long-range constraints, we create coupling to distant elements, and we do so very efficiently through the rigid bodies. We can emit the hypothesis that large motions are likely to impact the global deformation more than tiny elastic vibrations. So perhaps it's interesting to start with more aggressive layers first, and then gradually elastify. Then we also assume that gathering elements by strain rate is likely to give consistent motions, like it did for adaptive rigidification. Our approach performs solver iterations on a sequence of approximate models using mixtures of elastic and rigid parts with different percentages of rigidification. Rigid layers are built incrementally, always including the previous layer as a subset. To build the layers, we start by finding connected components. In adaptive rigidification, we would do a breadth first search to find them. However, we want the process to be incremental so we can build the layers as we generate bigger and bigger rigidification patterns without restarting the BFS for each pattern. 
Instead, we use disjoint sets to keep adding new elements and increasing strain rate order, eventually rigidifying everything for the courses layer. This means that we need to sort the elements by strain rates every time step, but the cost of this operation is small compared to the constraint solved. We keep a snapshots of the adjacency at different percentages of rigidification during the insertion and the disjoint set. This way we can cheaply capture the connectivity of our layers. This can all be pre-computed before the solve, but needs to be done once per step because the strain rate change over time. We can define trivial operators for the coarsening and refinement. For coarsening, we simply remove elastic constraints within elements and compute rigid body properties. For refinement, we add the constraints back. Simple enough. Here's a visual representation of what a progression of layers could look like. In this case, we start from aggressively rigid and elastify gradually. We can choose arbitrary percentages of rigidification for each layer, as well as a number of iterations spent on the layers. Of course, there are other types of patterns, which we explore in the paper. But again, our intuition is that focusing on larger motions first lead to better convergence. This is why we show this example that goes from rigid to elastic because it seems to provide the best results. Every layer is used temporarily during each time step to speed up the convergence, always ending with a fully elastic layer to appropriately solve for motions. See how the different layers use different shades of orange and change dynamically during the simulation based on strain rates. While there's no deformation within rigid bodies, they still need to remain attached to the rest of the soft body. We could modify the elastic constraints to handle the rigid body updates directly, but it can be expensive due to bookkeeping and makes things harder to parallelize. We preferably want to only update internal rigidified vertices once per layer. Instead, we add simple and cheap distance constraints to glue the rigid and elastic representation of a vertex back together. These are hard constraints to enforce that the rigid and elastic positions exactly match. This also keeps the rigid body boundary undeformed, which is important to prevent having to recompute the rigid body properties at each iteration. The constraint itself is simple. It's really just forcing a zero distance between the elastic vertex and its corresponding position within the rigid body. Here, xi is the elastic position, xr is the position of the center of mass, big R times Ri is a vector from the center of mass to the boundary vertex. We just want the tip of that green arrow to exactly match the elastic position. If we have linearized rigid motions like rotations stepped per particles on soft bodies, we end up with inflating meshes. This can be visualized with the example on the right where the velocities all point outwards. Here, the velocities are the little red arrows on this wheel example. Generally, the elastic constraints correct this deformation, but we remove these from our rigid patterns. We also need to eventually process the deformation meant to happen in the rigidified parts, so we have to preserve internal velocities. As a solution, we came up with this idea of residual velocities, which essentially represents all the non-rigid velocity per particle. Initially, residual velocity encompasses the full mesh velocities, we use them to build and step our rigid bodies. All the velocities that can be used for a rigid step for a layer gets deducted from the residual velocities. The leftover residual velocity gets passed down to the next layer. Likewise, on the elastification of a particle, all the residual velocities within the particle is released and stepped elastically, preserving elastic vibrations. We monitor the convergence over iterations for multiple types of rigidification patterns. Some patterns are automatically built, like random, strain-based, and stretch-based. Uh, but we also set up some layers like, that require a bit of dominant knowledge, like horizontal and vertical stripes. Let's zoom on the plot that was on the top left. Um, here, the y-axis shows the relative residual error. The x-axis shows the number of solver iterations. We start with layer iterations, so partially rigidified. Uh, patterns for all the vertical bars here, we do a layer switch. So we elastify a bit more, we elastify a bit more, and at the center is where we let everything go fully elastic. Let's note that this whole region here is fast to compute and can be seen as 
maybe some sort of preconditioning. We know that the randomized patterns during the simulation often perform pretty well, but we're completely unreliable jumping up and down during the simulation. The stretch based pattern is the one that seems to converge the best in terms of number of iterations, but is ultimately slow to compute because it comes from a single R value decomposition. The strain based pattern is the one that performs similarly to the stretch based pattern, but is uh, super cheap to compute because it's just a linear pass over all elements. For parallelization, we use a pre-computed graph coloring, much like standard elastic XPPD simulations. Um, so the constraints use that graph coloring for a gaussite like solve. Then we need to handle the rigid bodies. For a layer, all the rigid bodies are independent, otherwise they would be merged during the building process. The rigid bodies create a lot of new coupling because of the distance constraints at the boundaries. And well, because of that, we parallelize these constraints like a Jacobi solve. So we solve them all at the same time and accumulate their first contributions. For contacts, we use penalty constraints to correct interpenetration. The special twist here is that when contacts are on rigid vertices for a layer, the contacts are considered as rigid. For instance, in this wheel example, the first layer is always fully rigid. This means that we always consider the first contact for that layer as rigid contacts. This has the effect of propagating the impact through the whole soft body. At the next layer, regions near contacts are often in high strain re regions, meaning they tend to elastify for the second layer. As the contact vertices are now elastic, the contacts are handled elastically. Again, this all happens during a single time step. Much like adaptive rigidification, the speed up scales with resolution. The finer the initial models are, the more impressive the improvements become. We also monitored the time to sort and find components in this example. It remained below 0.02% of the time to solve. We know that unlike adaptive rigidification, the performances remain bounded by the fully elastic layer used to obtain accurate solutions. If we instead opted to use an oracle for approximate solutions, then we could terminate at lower resolutions, but that is not the case here. Time for a couple of examples, but before, let's take a look at this uh, histogram because all of them will include similar histograms. Um, here, the x-axis shows the time in seconds to compute a time step. The y-axis counts the number of frames that belong to a pin. And we stop the simulations once the solutions improve the initial elastic residual error by 90%. We can see that uh, we compare the standard elastic XPBD to our own multi-layer solver and orange. We start with the easiest scene. A purely rigid rotation instantly converges to the best solution at the first iteration, making our solver much faster than standard elastic simulations. We also better preserve momentum as we are not affected by the dissipative effect of the constraint solve. Then we challenge our algorithm with a scene that features global deformation while everything deforms at all time, our multi-layer solver outperforms the standard elastic simulations due to the long-range propagation introduced in partially rigid layers. This means that our solver works well in any scene, but shines even more with the ones that can be divided and independent moving parts with similar motions. This is the case for this example where each tentacle is mostly independent from the rest. Here's another contact example using deformable capsules with green stiff sides and white soft sides simulated with a relatively large time step of 0.01 .01 and discrete collision detection. Our solver is faster than the elastic simulation at any point in time, often greatly outperforming it and at worst consistently cutting on the computation time. Here we have a fundamentally different multi-layer solver that generates resolutions based on environmental input rather than a set of predetermined geometry. Our method steadily improves the convergence by generating coupling to distant elements using rigid patterns much like long-range constraints. This method does not need an oracle as it does not try to approximate the motions as rigid, it instead tries to improve the convergence of the solve through temporary rigid patterns. This in turn yields the full range of elastic motions. The code and videos are all available on my website. Feel free to have a look.